right. Good evening, everybody. My name is Dr. Taylor Clem, and I am the environmental and community horticulture agent here in Alachua County, Florida, as well as the Master Gardener Volunteer Coordinator here. Um, and welcome. Today's program is the living landscape. So the living landscape, I considered, to, I was thinking to myself one day, what is the living landscape? You know, I had um, a homeowner one time ask me about their landscape and how it's changing and evolving. And that ends up being something that I hear echoing. You know, I hear that statement a lot about how landscapes are seen to be as almost static entities, that they don't change. But in fact, landscapes are living, they're dynamic, they are constantly changing. And that's kind of what created the idea of doing this program. Because when we start thinking about like the Florida Friendly Landscaping Program, our natural environments, water resources, it all comes back to how we're managing the landscape. But if we start to consider what the landscape really is, it gives us an opportunity to think differently on how, what it becomes and how it's managed. And we look at it just in a different perspective. So uh, today as part of this program, um, we have the question and answer, the Q&A box available to you. It's on uh, your Zoom screen as well as the chat box. We have two Master Gardener volunteers that are here with us helping out, uh, Mark and Christy. And if you have any questions, feel free to put those in the chat box or in the Q&A, and they'll help respond to those throughout the program. But of course, at the end, we'll come back and we'll have some Q&A available for us. So uh, let's go ahead and jump in and get started. Let's see here. Can I control this? There we go. So the essential questions is, you know, uh, these are the questions I like to put at the beginning and the end of a program. I put them at the beginning because they are those big questions. It could be somewhere between one to three, uh, but it's a big question that at the end, I want you to feel comfortable answering. So uh, as part of the essential questions for today, by the time we finish this program, I, you'll be able to answer these three questions. What is an ecosystem? What are the different ways our landscape support life? And then how do I plan and manage a living landscape? So let's go ahead and jump in to the first thing. Um, let's look at this landscape. Um, and I mean, what do you see? What do you see in this landscape? Go ahead and put some of your thoughts within uh, the chat box. One statement said too much grass. Small islands of greenery, barren. Over, yeah, those are definitely over pruned palms. <laughs> hard lines. See, I hear hard lines. I think you probably have a background in landscape design. Uh, over manicured. Beautiful home though, that it is. Nice uh, contemporary modern home. Looks like this house is for sale. Yeah, they blacked that out. <laughs> Not much shade. Concrete curbing, that is kind of unique. Improperly pruned palm. Excellent. Nothing to attract pollinators. All right, so let's go forward. A little bit different. So this is a Florida-friendly landscape, of course. Um, you don't have to put all your thoughts on in, in all of these. I just want to get us going and moving. And here is another one. This is two. is just a typical Florida landscape. Um, this too is a Florida-friendly landscape. Um, but what I really want to ask is um, this one big question. When you look at these three landscapes, what makes them different? Is a residential landscape an ecosystem? I want to ponder that question for a second. Is a residential landscape an ecosystem? Do you consider an ecosystem? Um, so I'm actually going to launch a poll and I want to see what you all think. So you should now have that statement in front of you. Is a residential landscape an ecosystem? Yes. Some are, some aren't. No. I was always told don't give binary, don't allow for binary responses. So that's why you get the some are, some aren't. <laughs> In the chat box, I see it should be. I like that. Cool. All 
I like this. So I'll give it another, a couple more seconds for people to think about it and respond. Is a residential landscape in ecosystem? All right, I'll go ahead and close it. And I'll, let me show you the results. I believe you, you all can see this, correct? Yep, okay. So uh, of everybody that responded, 25 of you said, yes, it is. 14% said some are and aren't, but nobody said no. That's cool. I, I thought someone was going to say no. I, in, I figured somebody would think no. So I think that's kind of a cool perspective. That a, is a residential landscape and ecosystem. Yes, some are and some aren't. So I'd like to pick the brains of those, I'm not gonna give names. If you said some are and some aren't, what is one of the reasons why? And then I'll share it and you can put that in the chat box. Ooh, that's a good one. I like that statement. So one of the responses, someone said, I guess anything could be an ecosystem, but not a successful one. That's kind of, that's a cool perspective. That's a neat way to think about it. And I like to say, I want to go ahead and stop that share results. Okay. I like that statement. So yes, residential landscapes in a nutshell are ecosystems. So what I did is I wanted to ask around and see some, um, ah, yes, one person said, not sure what ecosystem means but I think some don't attract beneficial life, wildlife, pollinators, etc. That's a good response. Some don't provide all the functions. Excellent. So let's go ahead and jump forward. So these were our three landscapes again. So um, what I did is I reached out to uh, Dr. Basil Ioni. He's an assistant professor with UF in the School of Forest Resource and Conservation. And he actually has a lab called Residential Landscape Ecology Lab. If you ever meet this guy, he is a wonderful guy to meet. Um, and I asked him, I said, Basil, is a residential landscape an ecosystem? Because I want to reach out to him because this is his bread and butter, his cup of tea. So I asked him and I expected this long response being that he was a researcher. And my response I got from him was just absolutely. He flat out said, absolutely, landscapes are ecosystems. And he said, but it's important that we must know how to define what an ecosystem is. And the statement that we had earlier, it said yes, and uh, that they are all ecosystem, but some are not necessarily functioning as one. And that's absolutely true. So when I asked Basil, so what is that? How do we define an ecosystem so that we have a better understanding of knowing how our landscapes fit within that? So what is an ecosystem? And this is kind of the definition that he gave to me and when we were, we were having our conversation. He said it's a biological community of interacting organisms and their physical environment. So it's almost looking at a landscape, an ecosystem is where all the different components of life or the environment are integrating or working together in a spatial scale. So um, are they working together in you know, a big forest, a forest ecosystem, a mountain ecosystem, your backyard, that's ecosystem, a residential landscape, that's an ecosystem because it's defined by a physical environment. And then how does everything kind of interact together with it? So that's what an ecosystem is, is a biological community of interacting organisms or so how they all kind of commingle and their physical environment. So I think that's really, really neat. But let's jump in a little bit further about what an ecosystem is before we start to really point at the different pieces of our residential landscapes and seeing how they're living and what those different pieces or components contribute or do as impact to our environment and our landscapes. So anyways, what are the different components of an ecosystem? So we look at an ecosystem as pretty much two major areas, your abi abiotic and your biotic. Abiotic essentially means not living. Biotic means living. So abiotic 
we break down into two separate uh, main classifications. We have a climate and edific. So um, climate, that really relates. I mean, think about Florida. You know, think about our climate. In this picture that you're seeing, you know, there's, that's a typical Florida image right there, right? A big storm wall coming through, thunderstorm, uh, rain, our climate. What are some of the other uh, climate conditions that you think of when you think of Florida climate? Feel free to put those in the chat box too. Heat, our temperature, absolutely. <laughs> Heat, <laughs> it's hot, yeah. <laughs> Rain, absolutely. The sunshine, humidity. Wonderful, wonderful, yeah. So the, the climate, they all have an impact on our ecosystems. Those types of climates can dictate the types of plant material or how an entire ecosystem is structured. Um, so let's go ahead. Uh, one person put in uh, hurricanes. Absolutely. The impacts of hurricanes can have uh, evolutionary effects on how plants evolve. Um, and there's, I mean, there's great research that we can jump into, but that's a whole other conversation. But anyways, um, so that's climate. Climate has a huge role, but let's talk about edific. For simple, for simply put, um, it's soils. So soils, when we think of soils, I always like to tell people, soil is what's on the ground, dirt is what you get on your pants. Um, soil is not just sand, it's not just clay. There's way more to it, what's happening within it. But the composition of our soils has a sig significant impact on our ecosystems. Think how different soils are in all the places that you've been in your life. Florida has incredibly sandy soils. And those incredibly sandy soils, you know, water might infiltrate through them differently. Now imagine if you have a landscape where you have more clays, does the water infiltrate as quickly? Is that gonna have an impact on the ecosystem or the environment that you're in? And it absolutely does. Um, so soils have a major impact on what defines or helps create different ecosystems. So those are our two uh, abiotic uh, components of an ecosystem. Let's go ahead and jump into the biotic. And the soils, I feel like I can have a whole multiple lectures on soils, but we'll jump into the biotic. Um, biotic, we break into three major classifications. We have the producers and the consumers. So the producers and the consumers are essentially your producers are the bottom tier of all the living biotic things within the landscape. So that could be like your plant material. And the consumers are essentially, you're thinking of the food chain, the higher orders up on the food chain. And I like showing this picture right here is a great example of a producer and a consumer because we have the passion flower. That is a producer, it's a plant. So our plant material is pretty much, plant material is pretty much a producer plant. Um, and, <clears throat> excuse me, so it's producing uh, and it has its nectar, it's also a host plant. So then you have the, the larva, so the zebra longwing in this case, it's a butterfly that you see here, that's a consumer. It'll come in and it'll drink the nectar or it'll consume the nectar um, of the flower, but it'll also uh, lay eggs and the larva will consume or eat, uh, eat the passion flower. But then those producers, so that larva and the butterfly, that ends up being a meal for something a little bit bigger and so forth and so on. So we have our producers and our consumers, they can impact how our ecosystems are defined. But then the last one of that biotic are the decomposers. They are kind of the recycling uh, group of ecosystems and decomposers and how those decomposers exist or what types exist uh, has an impact on the type of ecosystem that you have. <laughs> One comment said, love passion flowers. I do too. It's a beautiful flower. So we covered those abiotic and biotic components of an ecosystem. So an ecosystem is essentially 
all those interacting elements within a physical area. And that can easily be within your landscape. So yes, res going back to the original question, are landscapes considered ecosystems? Are residential landscapes considered ecosystems? Yes, absolutely they are. Because we have an interaction between those biotic and abiotics uh, components of ecosystems within that space. So then it just comes down to what is, you know, a healthy ecosystem, et cetera. And we'll kind of talk about that in a bit. So why is it that we think of our landscapes as ecosystems? Why do we need to think about that? Feel free and kind of put your thought, um, your thoughts within the chat box. And remember, if you have any questions, feel free to put them in the Q&A box or you can put them in the chat box. So why is it important that we think of our landscapes as ecosystems? One person said because they depend on each other in some way. Mm -hmm. What we do impacts our ecosystems. To understand the effects of all of our practices, wonderful. So we can support a healthy environment. Supporting other living things. Wow, y'all are kicking butt. I got things flying in all of a sudden. Yeah, so there's one great one that defines how our landscapes perform. It's essentially, it's reflections of us. So we're looking at literally like, why is it important that we think about um, why like the physical, the science side, but we're also looking at the almost like the spiritual side in some cases from these responses that I'm com I'm getting. So that's really neat. So what you are mentioning is very, very important. And there's a couple key points that weren't pointed out in the chat box that I want to really, really emphasize on why it's, yes, why it is important that we consider our landscapes as part of an ecosystem or as ecosystems. And that is because residential land use across the entire state of Florida, as well as the United States, is the fastest growing land cover type. And when I talk about land cover type, that means, you know, um, great examples are agriculture. That's a land cover type. Natural undisturbed areas, conservation areas, those are land cover types. So we're actually losing a lot of agriculture in some conservation areas, and we're that's transforming into like residential and commercial land use. So that it is the fastest land growing type and it's having changes to the ecosystem and those ecosystems that are natural are now becoming what is more of a, a, um, a manipulated anthropogenic, I don't know the right word to use uh, landscape, but it's artificial ecosystem that we're creating. Um, but but those, those, that changing land use has a direct impact on water resources and all other ecosystems. And a lot of you mentioned that within uh, the chat box, which I think is phenomenal. So I always like to show this image. So if you've been in part of any of my programs, you'll see this picture. So this is the state of Florida. This is 2005 based off of the current development population change and how we're kind of seeing the land use change over time. So this is 2005 and the population is about 16 million at the time. This comes from the, what's called the Florida 2060 plan. But if we look at current land use changes and development, we see that those, uh, and with that land use change I'm mentioning, you know, we're seeing that population grow because we're expected the population to double to 32 million. But we're also with that, that land use is going to continue those land use patterns. Um, so what you're seeing in this picture, the red, that is developed areas like residential, commercial, um, institutional areas, anything that, you know, we're kind of building upon essentially. That's what we're looking at in, as of 2005. Um, and with that expected population change and an anticipated land use change that's associated with it, we start, this is actually the land use 
projected land use map of where we see developed areas by 2060. So this obviously changes its ebbs and flows as new things change. Um, the, the turnpike or that turnpike, the, the toll road expansions, that's not included on this map. Um, so there's a lot of variability, but the biggest thing that we're seeing is that the developed land is significantly growing. It's just a matter of how exactly is it gonna be growing. So that's why we need to consider, okay, if we're changing land use, we need to make sure that we don't look at a landscape as an isolated part of a neighborhood or a neighborhood is an isolated entity upon itself, but it's actually an important part of Florida's ecosystems to help protect Florida's ecosystems as we move forward with new population and new land development. So that's why I want us to, you know, coming back to that living landscape idea is let's look at where in the landscape we're seeing these different parts of life that we that exist. So I'm going to put this in the context of how we those different components of uh, an ecosystem. So we have the climate, the abiotic and the biotic. So the abiotic, which is the climate and the, the that soils, I just simplified into soils. And then we have the um, biotic, which we have the producers and consumers, as well as the decomposers. So we'll kind of flash around the landscape in these four sections. And, you know, as I was putting this together, I realized that like I could do a whole series on climate, a whole series on soils, whole one on decomposers, a lot of them on decomposers actually, and producers and consumers. So we're going to just hit on these. But I think the biggest thing is that you're already going to, uh, we're gonna hit on all of these, but you're gonna see that everywhere that you look in the landscape, there is life and there's a balance that's created in how we manage it to help promote a healthy landscape and ecosystem. So let's go ahead and let's jump within, right into climate. So I want you to ask, you know, I want to ask you all, sorry. Um, and this is something we kind of already talked about a bit, but it's important that we reiterate it, is how does climate impact our environment and residential landscapes? Go ahead and put one of your, some of your thoughts in there. Not necessarily like we're talking about heat or weather, but what do you think climate does and influences within those landscapes? Feel free to put that in the chat box. Seasonal patterns, very good. Good bugs, bad bugs. It influences the types of plants that we want to grow, absolutely. What types of plants and animals can survive? Types of trees, yeah. Wind resistant trees, yeah. I mean, some of our most highly wind resistant trees that we have in the state of Florida with regards to like a hurricanes are a lot of those that have evolved within climates where they have hurricanes. Most of them, not all of them, like swamp oaks. They like to fall over. <laughs> Same with laurel oaks. Actually, excellent, global warming can affect the way things can grow and when, yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. So, um, and I'll talk, I got to remember, I have a little talking point where I'm actually going to talk a little bit about climate and wildlife in, in a few minutes. So, and how much irrigation will be used. Man, y'all are so good. So, here's a couple of things that I pointed out. Um, oop, here we go. We got to work. So, climate in a nutshell, there, we can go so far beyond this, but climate can determine where species live. We talked about that with flora. So definitely the plants, what kind of plants can you put in your landscape? But that also depend, determines like fauna, how, what type of animals or macroinvertebrates or all the other things that living within our landscape, it kind of helps determine, you know, where they can live. Um, it also interacts like how species interact um, and biological timing. And one of the things that I think about is like how species interact is think about um, a good one example that I think about is milkweed and monarch butterfly. The monarch butterflies, they are migratory. Um, and jump in Mark or Christy if I miss, if I say something wrong right here. But um, they're migratory 
And I believe it's a three-year migration cycle. That's one thing I can never remember if it's a three-year migration cycle or not. But anyways, um, but their host plant is the milkweed. And part of that milkweed, you know, them blooming and flowering is really important to help attract the monarchs to lay their eggs so then they can serve as a host. Now imagine if that timing was mixed up, would that be good for the monarch butterflies or the milkweed, you know, with regards to pollination, if something interrupt, if something with the climate interrupted that cycle. So that's just a, 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 one example, but how species interact, I mean, can be, is directly linked to climate conditions, as well as biological timing. And I got uh, an example of the biological timing that I want to show you. So this talks about that species interaction. Um, you know, I mentioned monarchs and uh, milkweed, but also the zebra longwing and the passion flower. Their biological timing is linked up with one another, where there's flowering and blooming and laying of the eggs and the matings of the zebra longwings are kind of all happening at the same time. And that's just because they've co-evolved together within these specific climate conditions. But I like to show this one, because this one I always have uh, discussions about with homeowners. What is this? I mean, it's a peach. Why? It's a peach. <laughs> um, but why do I have a peach on here? I know some one person's from Nassau County, so they can probably grow peaches a little bit better than us. Maybe. Or it's about the same. But why do I have peaches on here? Mm, and how does climate impact peaches? Oh, they're all coming flying in now. Yes, they are grow they are hard to grow in Florida. But a lot of the people put in chill hours. Chill hours. Yes, climate, chill hours. So peaches need a certain amount of chill hours in order to essentially blossom. So then um, they can then pollinate it and create the fruit. Well, we have some peaches that need a high amount of chill hours. That you Like even in Alachua County, we don't get enough chill hours. Uh, so you could plant that peach and it'll never fruit um, unless you get something weird happen, but, um, like Mark Frank always says, plants don't read textbooks. So, um, but anyway, <laughs> but anyways, um, but there are plants like some peaches that they have a much smaller amount of chill hours. So if you can get those chill hours and then they'll start to, the, to bloom and then say you end up coming in with late, late frost, it's going to kill those blooms and it's not going to have, be able to go and to develop those fruits. So the peaches, that's kind of a unique one because yes, they are difficult to grow in Florida, but those chill hours, depending on where you're at, you got to be in that, like that, uh, that Goldilocks sweet spot point where it's not too cold, not too hot, depending on the variety that you have. And that's just based off of climate. If you want to have a successful peach production from a peach tree, you know, knowing your chill hours is going to be very important for the species or uh, variety that you end up picking. Yeah, we had one question come and said, well, statement said, new to Florida, but I would not think peaches are good for this climate. So if you're in South Florida, I think the line is kind of like Pinellas County is the southernmost that we can get some of our um, southernmost region that we can get some of our peaches. Um, we actually have an EDIS publication that has the chill hour requirements and it shows where they can be grown within the state. But anyways, <clears throat> so we'll go ahead and jump forward. So climate, climate has a huge impact on ecosystem development, um, but also just the, determining on how, what plants you can plant, et cetera. So y'all did really well. So let's jump right into the soil section. So soils, how does soil impact our environment and residential landscapes? What are some of the things that you think about? Actually remember, and feel free to put that in the chat box too. Um, when I was in my undergrad, I took a soils class. I was so unexcited because I would say, why am I having to take a class about dirt, my uneducated self? soil um and now just i learned the complexity of soil my goodness it's amazing i love it so some of the responses that i'm getting are related to drainage so soil type 
what kind of moisture availability? Do you have moisture that's held in the soil a long time? Does it drain really well? The amount of organic matter, absolutely. Uh, nutrients, yep, yep, yep. Nutrients, soil compaction, fill soil, removing organic matter. So a lot of that has to do with how soil is managed. Absolutely. Poor soil management. If you don't, if you don't take care of your soil or have healthy soil, you're gonna have a very unhappy landscape. Nutrients, soil composition, soil analysis, pH, wonderful, pH. Yeah, it just gives the structure for ability to roots to grow. Excellent, I'm having a hard time keeping up with y'all. This is wonderful. A lot of residential landscapes have compacted soils. Absolutely, absolutely. Soil pH, yep. Buffer to the aquifer, nice, that's a good one. So let's talk a little bit about these. So you all are doing great in, uh, in your understanding of some of this stuff and it's phenomenal, I love it. But um, so let's talk about some of those soils. 10 points though, to anybody that can tell me what kind of soil type this is in this picture. 10 points where the points don't matter. <laughs> Oh, we have a winner. Yeah. Mayaka. Mayaka soil. Good job. Yeah. <laughs> That's like our number one soil. That's like our state soil um, is Mayaka soil. But um, that's that was a very technical question too. So, um, but yeah, Mayaka soil. But let's talk about some of those benefits. So if we look at all the benefits of soil, it's almost numer it's innumerable. Um, so I craft, I wrote them all down for you all. No, I just simplified it. Um, so soil, soil can help in the simplified view of what soil can do is it helps support ecological cycles. So we think about the carbon, carbon cycle, carbon sequestration, it can actually grab some of that at atmospheric nitrogen, it can store it within the soil. Um, nitrogen cycle, you know, how nitrogen is released the atmosphere, how it's brought down from the atmosphere by microbes and made available to the nutrients, um, oxygen, water, the nutrient cycle, different nutrient cycles. So soil is helping support these natural systems or these na natural cycles that are happening within the landscape. This is the base of pretty much every natural ecological cycle that's happening within our environment is something that has to do with our soils. So, you know, we don't look at just soils as just like something you got on your pants. It is the base of everything, of all life pretty much to a certain extent. And, you know, it has these cycles, but some of those like strong benefits that we have are these ecosystem services, direct benefits that we get are agricultural, those are one of those ecosystem services. Our food is dependent on a healthy uh, soil, healthy managed soil. Some farmers are, um, and ag growers, they are most successful because they manage the soil appropriately. By managing the soil appropriately, um, it helps produce better food, it helps protect water quality, it significantly reduces the nutrient inputs required, um, and it essentially it doesn't lead us to a dust bowl event again. Um, but other ecosystem services is water, I mean soil helps clean water. It is, like mentioned from one of our statements, it's almost like a buffer. So what, as water percolates or infiltrates through the soil, the soil can clean a lot of the pollutants, a lot of the heavy metals, out of that water before it ends up in our aquifer. You know, some of the issues that we have with stormwater management is a lot of stormwater. Again, think of stormwater as a component of an ecosystem. So stormwater, it collects anything and runs off into our storm drains and it picks up oils, pollutants, other any non-point source pollutants and carries it down to our streams. And in some cases here in Alachua County, two of our big streams go directly into a sink. So that water 
and all the pollutants that it's carrying and stormwater that ends up in our roadways goes straight down into the aquifer. Whereas soil, if we let that infiltrate naturally and go back into the soil, that soil can clean the water. And then soil can also help regulate temperatures and support different habitats. So again, I like showing this picture of the soil. Um, but let's go ahead and let's talk then about the producers and the consumers. So this statement's a little bit different um, than the other two, but how can producers and consumers depend? And I didn't really like using the word depend, but it's the only one I could reasonably think of, but how can they depend on our landscapes? Maybe benefit from, but I don't like using the word depend. It's the only thing I could think of, but how can they benefit? Go ahead and put that in the chat box. Provide habitat, wonderful. Provide habitat. Food, shelter, mm-hmm. Absolutely. I should have put it on here. I don't know if I have it in here, but I do talk about in one of my previous programs, I talk about um, attracting wildlife to a landscape. Um, and part of that is you look at those basic needs of survival, and that's food, shelter, water, protection, um, and place for like reproduction. Um, those are the basic needs of survival. And without that, you can't you can't survive essentially. Um, and that's why it's important we think about our landscapes is how can our landscapes you know, we don't want wildlife to depend on our landscapes, but to a certain extent with wildlife or habitat fragmentation, they could get to a point in some areas where they do depend on our landscapes. And it's really important that we talk about these producers and the consumers because the producers, again, plant material. If we're thinking about our ecosystems, our residential ecosystem, that plant material choices, those choices that we put into that design, um, because those residential areas, those are, just, those are disturbed landscapes. Those plants, they become the producers to a certain extent. Not all of them, but they do become a major component of it. But then they attract primary consumers who then attract secondary consumers, tertiary, and then higher order within that uh, trophic level. So um, it's important that we do think about food, water, cover, um, places for reproduction when we're planning and designing our ecosystems so we can attract the important produ or sorry important uh, consumers into our landscape to give them wildlife and habitat that they need that would otherwise be disturbed landscape. Um, and in the chat box, you're probably seeing some links pop up from Mark and Christy relating to soil health and soil testing or soil within the residential landscapes. Those are going to be great publications for you to have. But anyways, so looking at this, I, you know, it's important to think that we start off small, but then we bring in those primary consumers and then the secondary consumers. And as we get up higher and higher, uh, Trevor scale, things get like less and less of population. And that's just because of the resource availability. So we start taking away a lot of those producer materials, then that's a reduced population, that primary and so, so on up. Uh, but anyways, so I wanna talk about from a little bit larger scale on the impacts of wildlife and how it can be dependent off of um, the plant choices that we are making or providing within our landscapes. So one of these things I like to talk about is wildlife habit uh, fragmentation. With land use change, like I said, residential land use is the number one change in, uh, number one land use change that's happening across uh, Florida and across the country. So essentially what happens is as you have this natural habitat and as we break it up in different chunks because we're developing, that creates these little smaller fragmented chunks. So that has a higher conflict zone, which is created. So those edge, those edges that are close to that development. And I mean, we in our, uh, all of our landscapes, all of our homes, we talk about pests within our landscapes, like 
deers eating my cabbage or uh, squirrels in my compost bin. You know, these are all just conflict. These are all just landscape conflicts. One of uh, my friends who's uh, who's in extension lives down in South Florida. He lives on big acreage, a lot of acreage. And when you're talking about wildlife that's coming through his landscape, he has bears, Florida panther, you know, some big mammals coming through. And that's where this conflict starts happening is that juxtaposition or that overlay of the development and wildlife and how do they interact. And the more fragmentation we have, we have higher conflict where you start seeing some, um, you know, animals are put down because they are too high of a risk for the population or stuff like that. Um, but it also ends up happening is there's a decrease of just overall habitat quality. There, the reproduction, there's a decrease in reproduction success. So that comes down to diversity, sorry, the genetic diversity. So how well essentially the gene pool is within those habitats. Because you had a big population that was connected in one large habitat and all of a sudden those habitats are small little chunks. And that genetic diversity can't continue because you're having a kind of your shoe holding or pigeon uh, holding the entire population or part chunk of a population in one smaller space. Uh, one great example is with the Florida panther is the Florida panther population used to kind of stretch all the way up and actually co-mingle with the population in Alabama. But due to wildlife fragmentation that hasn't happened in a long time um, and the genetic diversity of the Florida panthers has significantly diminished and there has been some cases where they're actually taking panthers from the Florida population to Alabama and vice versa to help support that genetic diversity. Um, so that's just all a huge major impact that has to do with um, the producers and consumers within our landscape and that land use change. So we're thinking about our landscapes as ecosystems. We can start to reconnect these different um, fragmented habitats. And then going back to a statement I wanted to, wanted to say is, you know, we talk about climate change and how it has an impact on producers and consumers and wildlife fragmentation. There is a study that came out um, that was looking at some of the, uh, the different species. I, I wish I can remember specifically some of the species that are within the coastal habitats of Florida and looking at their migration that would have to go inward associated with sea level rise, which is associated with climate change. And many of those populations, I believe that there's like 200 different species that they won't be able to migrate inwards inland to different environments because of wildlife or that uh, fragmentation of the environment. Um, and that's gonna have a huge impact uh, ecologically on those if we're having losing ecosystems and then also not being able to provide an ecosystems for some of those other wildlife. But anyways, so when we talk about producers and consumers, we think about how do our plant material, how do they benefit those consumers to help bridge that fragmented landscape. So now we'll jump into the decomposers. Uh, so the decomposers, ooh, so uh, what what do we see here? We have some, back, from left to right, we have some bacteria. Um, we have a, I believe that's a chicken of the woods uh, mushroom. And on the right, we have an earthworm. What do you think is the role of decomposers within our landscapes? And you feel free to put this in the chat box. Help keep it healthy, yeah. Cycling of nutrients. Yes, putting nutrients back in the soil. They clean up. That's right, Cindy. <laughs> yeah. So those those these decomposers, what they start doing is they're taking all that plant material and they're breaking it back down. Or the uh, the invertebrates, the macroinvertebrates, the bugs, or anything that's dead, dying the decomposers, they just break it down and they bring it back into the soil and they're putting it 
into um, a condition or into, yeah, into a condition to make those nutrients available to be uptaken by the plants. So all of a sudden, you're closing a loop where you're having the soil is uh, helping support these plants, these producers that provide the food, helps provide them nutrients, and they grow, and the, the uh, producers and consumers come in, they munch, they die off, and then as they break down those decomposers, they take it and whoop, bring it right back into the soil. And you can actually build really, really healthy soils by really taking advantage of some of these decomposers. And I mean, thinking about compost, composting within your garden, that's essentially you're just kind of creating your own soil through decomposition. Um, so anyways, um, it's really important to think about how these decomposers play a significant role because they exist within our landscapes, everywhere within our landscapes. And how we manage the landscape can actually impact the quality of our soil. So we wanna make sure that we're managing a landscape in a way that we're promoting these beneficial decomposers so we can have uh, develop healthy soils that can then help with the healthy structures for plants, holding on to nutrients, helping with water quality, et cetera. But I also like to talk about um, the other roles that we can have with some of our decompo uh, decomposers. So we're not gonna get into this topic, but it's the, uh, if you're ever interested, just look up the Wood Wide Web. And that actually talks about that symbiotic relationship um, that plants have with some of those decomposers or those that specific, those mycorrhizal fungi that actually grow into the roots of trees. And they essentially send carbohydrates, um, the trees send or plant materials send carbohydrates to the mushrooms and the mushrooms give them uh, some of the nutrients that they need by helping collect that, uh, their mycorrhizal networks. And that's a fungus that is, again, symbiotic. It's taking in the sugar so it can grow, but it's also loading those plants with some of those nutrients that they need. Um, and, you know, they can even, in some case, we even look at mycorrhizal networks as a fungus. They can actually transport other nutrients from different trees and plant material. So decompose, uh, decomposers have a significant role in helping break down nutrients, but also they have a very significant role in helping provide directly those nutrients to plant material um, from the soil. So, the, so when we looked at the living landscape, we talked about those four major components of what we would call as part of an ecosystem. So we have, the, remember, it's the abiotic and the biotic. So the abiotic, that climate and soil conditions, and the biotic were those producers, consumers, and then the decomposers that we just talked about. So our landscapes can contain or they can support all of this. They are part of an ecosystem, but it comes back to what you all mentioned earlier when we're talking about, is it an ecosystem? Yes, it is, but is it being maintained properly? And that's why we have to really put a lot of emphasis on how do we maintain happy, healthy landscapes, or in this case, a living landscape. So let's talk about managing living landscape for a little bit, and then uh, we can start to wrap things up, and then we'll open it up for some questions. Um, so we know that residential landscapes are ecosystems. According to Basil, absolutely. So they are ecosystems, but are they healthy ecosystems? Are they sustainable? Are they resilient? So sustainable is thinking about how can we maintain this landscape over time? Is it, can we do it sustainably? Um, and resilience, I really like to talk about resilience because that, uh, that really comes back to you know, if a disease comes into a landscape or some big pressure or stress comes into a landscape, how quickly does it kind of just pop back into health and say, I'm good to go? You know, having resilient landscapes is very, very important. So are those, eco those residential ecosystems, are they sustainable and are they resilient? So this is where it comes into big, big discussion like, okay, so how do we get there? So we're not gonna be able to hit talk about how we create res, uh, resilient, sustainable landscapes, but we'll briefly talk about it because this is all concepts that probably all of you know already. The first one has to do with the Florida Friendly Landscaping Program. So this really looks at how do we cr create landscapes 
that are um, that are protecting water quality, quantity, it attracts wildlife, and it helps create sustainable and resilient landscapes. So there's the nine principles of the Florida Friendly Landscaping Program, right plant, right place. And that really comes back to those climate conditions, environmental conditions that you're planting, because there's an ecosystem that's kind of forming around your landscape already that has to do with those um, abiotic functions, the soil, and the climate. So right plant, right place. For the plants that thrive well in there, are they going to be native or non-native? Uh, bonus points if you get some more natives in there, but sometimes it can be really hard to establish native plants in very disturbed soils for new residential landscape development. But all uh, moving forward, but you know the other principles, water efficiently, fertilize appropriately, you know mulching, attracting wildlife, manage yard pests, recycle, reduce stormwater runoff and protecting the waterfront. So these are all strategies. These different principles are a series of strategies that we can use within our landscapes to help build that healthy residential landscape ecosystem. If you're not familiar with the Florida Friendly Landscaping Program, feel free to reach out directly to me, any of our Master Gardener volunteers. Um, and we also have on our YouTube page, which I'll send you later, we have uh, some webinars, old webinars that have to do with the Florida Friendly Landscaping Program. But it's also important that we think about our landscapes, not necessarily just how we're managing them, but it's important that we think about them as a scale. When we think of an ecosystem, you know, I think one of the things that we're doing that's counterintuitive is that we are confining ourselves spatially. It's like, oh, this is, a, this is an aquatic ecosystem. This is a forest ecosystem. Um, this might be a wetland mystic ecosystem over here, but it's important to know that, yes, we can classify them as these different ecosystems, but in actuality, they are all relate to one another. They're all directly linked to one another regardless. And it's important to talk about that scale. And right here is just an example of scale of well, ecological investigations. Um, but it's just looking that, yes, you, in, in this instance, it's you're an individual forest patch. But in actuality, that forest patch is in a cluster of other forest patches and they all link together. But then when you zoom out some more, you're seeing that greater patch, that mosaic. That is where all those different land uses, how they're all functioning together. It's not just one entity. It's one component of a much bigger, but also infinitely smaller ecosystems. So scale is very important because we can look at an individual residence, but then we can zoom out to, okay, that's a residence, but then we have a whole entire community or neighborhood. How does that neighborhood fit as an ecosystem within an entire city or county or a specific watershed? So you can see how the scale can go from small to big very quickly and they're all directly linked to one another. So it's really important that we don't pigeon ourselves in this very specific context, but we think of those Zoom in really close, but zoom back out. How does it fit within the bigger picture? Zoom back in again and zoom back out. So knowing that scale and that change of scale is going to be very important. We're thinking about how our landscape has a role within a larger ecosystem. Because sometimes, you know, when I, I've spoken with people or people are not um, willing to make some changes to help conserve water, you get the, well, I'm just a drop in the bucket. Well, yes, you might be one drop in the bucket, but with your entire community as a drop in the bucket, all of a sudden you have a bucket full of wasted water. You know, so it's important to think about like how, even though you, it might be a small drop in the bucket, it adds up very, 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 very quickly, when we, especially when we start looking at these different scales. Um, another thing that we need to think about when we are managing our landscapes is how are we managing them and how are we maintaining them? This is a model that I use when I'm talking about landscape maintenance. <clears throat> and with landscape maintenance, there's a couple things that I talk about. There's site selection and source. So where are you planting? Where are you getting your plants from? Um, and what kind of plants do you wanna choose and how it has an impact on maintenance? But then social capital that relates to who's maintaining it. But the one that's always forgotten, oh, sorry, I had animations with this. 
the one that's always forgotten is time. Landscapes change. I always like to joke and say plants are this magical thing called grow. You plant them as one gallon containers in your landscape, they will grow to be however big they can be. Um, a great example that bothers me quite often is seeing sweet viburnums. You know, they're, they're essentially trees. They're small trees that want to get 20 feet tall, yet we're putting them right in front of windows. So we're constantly having to prune them and prune them and prune them and prune them to force them at a height. You know, that's just poor planning on thinking about what is that size of that mature plant and how will it grow over time. A landscape today that is planted now um, with young trees, those trees will slowly grow over time. And you're going to have a sunny landscape slowly become a shady landscape. And how is that going to change how your landscape is maintained and managed, even if it comes down to plant selection? So time is something that can happen both quick and slow. And how we plan man's landscapes and how we understand landscapes really under, it goes into an understanding of how they change over time as well. So I like to show this picture. Um, which you might be confused. You might be saying to yourself, Taylor, why is this man staring at me? Um, <laughs> um, yeah, lightning takes out a tree. That's right. And then you'll have sun again. Uh, but when you look at this picture, what, what, what do you see? What, what is this? I didn't take this picture. This came from Time Magazine, USA Today, I mean, a few years ago. All right. Have you... Uh, Oh man, have any of you ever seen me give this presentation before or use this? One person right off the fact bat got it, yeah. <laughs> um, so this is a truck driver. So this is, yeah, some of you, it's like sun damage to the skin, sun exposure. Yeah, there's a different strong asymmetry. And that's because this is a truck driver. So the left side of his face where you can see that damage associated with sun, that's just because I mean, the window, that's where his face was exposed to sun throughout his entire career. Is that something, um, <laughs> you saw this picture one time on Facebook, yeah. Um, is this something that this truck driver saw like immediately? Or is it something that took place over time? This isn't a change that he saw from day to day. This is just a change that he saw slowly progress over his career. It's not like he woke up one day and it's like all of a sudden, all the sun exposure damage is there. But this is something that he knew it was changing, but he couldn't detect the change. So change can be quick or it can be very slow. And our landscapes are the same exact way. And it's how do we plan or anticipate them? So you know, what are the changes that can happen in our landscape daily, seasonally, annually, or in some cases, over a lifetime? And how does that have an impact on how we want to manage our landscapes or these landscape ecosystems? Um, and one that I really like to point out is, you know, in some cases, you know, we're talking about what defines an ecosystem. One that we didn't mention earlier was fire. Fire plays a significant role in Florida's ecosystems. Fire suppression in a lot of our ecosystems has actually led to way more bad than good. So that's why we do so many controlled burns is because we learned the benefit of having what we call fire ecology or that study of fire's role within the landscape because that is creating an ecosystem. It's helping maintain that ecosystem like a pine flatwoods, um, is one of the big ones that can have um, that is dependent off of fire. And we can go to the whole conversation about when we're talking about ecosystems built around fire, you know, the, um, the gopher tortoise, it's an endemic species to Florida. So it only exists within Florida. And it is unbelievably important in helping maintain the, its ecosystems or those healthy ecosystems. So they have their burrows all over the pine flatwoods where they're living. Like one gopher tortoise might have little, multiple little uh, holes or burrows that it digs in. Fire comes in. And when fire, slow fires come in, you know, that's nat like native Florida, natural Florida fires, a lot of those animals within that ecosystem, whoop, they dive down into those burrows. You'll find snakes and mice and other small amphibians, reptiles, and other, uh, other mammals all hiding within those burrows. And once the fire passes, they all come back out again.
If we did not have a gopher tortoise, think how different that would look. You know, so that's why it's important to think about why, they, how are ecosystems defined and how are we seeing them in the landscapes? And if we're having our residential landscapes, not, I'm not saying go burn your landscapes, <laughs> um, but it's important to think that how our ecosystems are created in such a unique way to support specific life. And our landscapes can be great ways to help support them as well. And understanding those time changes is gonna be a big factor in that. Oh, and then I had this GIF. <laughs> But it's also really, it's important, like, as we're going through this, you know, we know that there's important parts of an ecosystem and that our landscapes play a significant role. Our residential um, landscapes, those five, the, the sorry, the ecos, our landscapes can play a significant role in being ecosystem providers, especially in those disturbed areas. So we need to think of them as ecosystems. So, you know, when someone comes and talks to you about like this, I want to have a landscape, you know, it's not a static thing. My, my landscape is alive, it is living, and it, there's a whole cycle of stuff that's happening um, all throughout my landscape and are all dependent off of how I'm managed. So you can always feel like Dr. Frankenstein and you can say it's alive. Or my favorite, you can always do the young Frankenstein version as well. But anyway, so that brings us back to uh, our essential questions. What is an ecosystem? You should now feel comfortable to know kind of what an ecosystem is as we're talking about those different components and that diversity of um, biological species, all and how they all interact within an environment together. Um, and then what are those different ways that our landscapes support life? So we're looking at, you know, that climate, we're looking at the soil conditions, we're looking at those decomposers, those producers and consumers. And then how do I plan and manage a living landscape? So that comes back to talking about that Florida Friendly Landscaping pr uh, Program, talks about how we think about our landscapes at scale, at different scales, as well as how does time play an impact on how we're managing our landscapes. So um, with that being said, I want to go ahead and open it up to any questions that anybody may have, but always feel free to reach out to me. Um, here's my contact information. Uh, we also have the Master Gardener Help Desk that you can reach out to, that mag at alachuacounty.us. Follow us on Facebook. We have a YouTube channel now, um, which is the UFIFAS Extension Alachua County. And we actually put recordings of all of our online webinars on there in case you wanna come back and revisit them. As well as uh, we have a podcast, the extension cord, which you can find on all your major providers. So if you listen to podcasts, you can, wherever you go find them, you can search us up extension cord and we should pop right up but anyways thank you all very very much and if uh we'll stay on here and feel free to ask us any questions within the q a or within the chat box yes yeah, so great question if you are in um hillsborough county um let me go ahead i'm gonna stop this share um i'll stop my share and i'll exit this um, let me pull up that, or Mark, can you grab that Hillsborough County contact? Okay, uh, we'll get you Hillsborough County, Hillsborough, <laughs> Hillsborough County's contacts. So IFAS Extension, we are present in every single county throughout the state of Florida. Um, and I'm specifically Alachua County's office. If you need help figuring out what that contact is for your county's office, we, we have those contacts available to you so we can get them to you. That's a great question. Yes. So we had one question in coming in uh, talking about soil test. Um, so the question is, should I test my uh, test soil in only one spot on my landscape or should I test multiple spots? I recommend, um, I recommend, um, doing multiple locations. If you have a spot where the soils are all about the same and you plan on doing the same thing there, that's fine to do a sample, doing a specific sample at that location. But say you have different spots of your landscape that you're going to be planting different plant material, it could be worth doing different tests for them. And when you're actually collecting those samples, like say I wanted to do my landscape bed in the front of my home, 
what I would do is I would collect small samples from that area that I want to plant and I'd mix them all together. Um, so it's almost kind of creating an average of that area that I want to plant and then I'll take my sample out of there. On our soil test forms, we have complete instructions on how to do that. But the biggest thing is if you're gonna have different areas that you plan on managing different differently or you're noticing the environment, the soils might be slightly different, I would recommend doing separate tests for those locations. So we had another question come in that asked, um, ooh, we got some, so on to piggyback on that. Um, one question is soil test kits. We have a soil test form online that you can pick up and um, you don't necessarily need the soil test test kit bag to submit your soil in. You just gotta make sure it's, that it's dried out thoroughly. But reach out to our county extension office or your county extension office for complete details on how to do that soil submission, especially with some of the offices being closed, but it doesn't require coming to our office in Alachua County to do those. What are some of my favorite plants? Um, Great question. I have too many. Um, do you want native or non-native? I'll give you native plants. So one of my, I actually have a, a plant list of my favorites that I have. Um, I was looking at doing some um, ornamental grasses and I used to love, I still like it, muley grass. It's a native grass. And we do have the cultivar that has like the white flowerings, the alba. I believe is the cultivar name of it. And it creates the, the white flowers and the purple flowers is beautiful. But um, I really like the muley grass, but I really fall for ornamental grasses. I am now leaning strongly towards the fakahatchee grass. I like that more just cause I like, I'm liking the structure. It can maintain that upright structure a little bit better than the muley grass. Christy or Mark, do you have any favorite plants that you like to use? One of my favorite non-natives is a thyralis. I love thyralis. I also call that one peanut butter plant. So one question that came in, um, it said, should we be trying to work with the soil type we presently have or try to change the soil with amendments? So that's a yes, no answer. So, Soil pH has a huge impact on the type of plants that you can have. To a certain extent, it's not worth trying to permanently change your soil pH because you can apply lime and that's gonna raise that soil pH and it can take it too high where it makes it really hard to uh, grow certain plants. And, um, but you can't bring it back down unless you're at doing sulfur applications. So when it comes to pH, I recommend just working with what you got and other soil amendments like compost um, and kind of tilling that in with the top few inches of the soil will never hurt by all means, because what it does, it helps buffer the soil a little bit. So it kind of gives you flexibility in that soil pH requirement. And um, it can help with nutrient holding, uh, how it can hold the nutrients and the water holding capacity. So those are some, that's an amendment that you could benefit from with, you know, depending on if, especially Florida sandy soils. Great question. Thank you, Christy, for posting that link on soil testing. Um, you, if, if you can go to whichever county extension office is closest to you. Yes, we don't care that much. <laughs> Um, because I, it happens a lot because there's our old office, which was right by Gainesville's airport. We're now technically in Jonesville. Um, our old office was in the, over by Gainesville airport. We used to be, oh geez, um, 10 minutes from Putnam County line. So we're like Melrose, Florida is, uh, part of Melrose is in Alachua, part of it's in Putnam County we'd get a lot of the Putnam County side of Melrose because it would take them 15 minutes to get to our office, but it could take them almost 45 minutes to an hour to get to the office in Putnam County, which is in Palatka. It can be hard to find Fakahatchee grasses at nurseries. Yes, but if you find some of those bigger local nurseries, sometimes they'll order them in for you. 
for you if you ask them. Yeah, you're not going to find like Fakahatchee. I don't think I've seen Fakahatchee at like the Home Depot's Lowe's. Um, but here in Alachua County, um, Greenhouse Nurseries has it, uh, Blue Star Nursery, um, and I believe Green, did I say Greenhouse? Greenhouse? What's the one Wilt Millhopper? Um, I can't think of it. What's the name of the, the Garden Gate Nursery? Thanks, Mark. So just go ahead and feel free to call them. Um, Mark put in a, uh, a link about the Florida Association of Native Nurseries. They have a plant locator where you can type in the plant you're looking for and it'll tell you which ones um, you have or where the closest one available to you. So irrigating for your, lands, for your landscapes, <clears throat> sprinkler systems or soaker hoses or something else. So if you're gonna be irrigating your landscape, if you have an in-ground irrigation system, they can work really well, but you have to maintain them. Low flow devices like drip tubes, drip, not drip tape, drip tubes, micro sprays, those are gonna be best for your shrubs because you can put that water exactly on, right on the root systems. Um, soaker hoses, I don't necessarily recommend because they break down and they're not always, they're just distributing water all throughout the entire hose. So I don't recommend those, they're not as precise. But I mean, there's nothing wrong with doing the old, the old school method just walking around with the hose. We actually find that people watering their landscapes with the hose use significantly less water than those with sprinkler systems because, A, we're lazy people and we don't want to have to go do extra work unless we have to. So we actually wait until a lot of our plants are at that period of where drought stress, where then it's like, okay, now we'll go water them. And then we, that's actually healthier for the plants when you're riding drought, because, drought stress because they're producing or trying to create more roots. Yes, we did move down to um, Jonesville in a temporary office. We we're supposed to be out at the airport until through October, but then we had sewer and water breakage. Uh, so they went ahead and moved us early. So we're in Jonesville because our new permanent office is being moved out to Newberry where the Canterbury Equestrian Facility is. That's gonna be the big uh, extension facility. Oh, thank you, Colin. TNT Nursery has Fakahatchee grass too. That's up on uh, 39th Avenue, just west of 75, I believe. Our offices are currently closed. Um, you can contact us by phone or email. Um, if you need to drop things off or pick things up, we actually have a Rubbermaid tub sitting out our front door. <laughs> we do have a lot of tips for designing with natives. Send me an email. Let me go ahead and reshare the screen with my contact information. Pull up the right one. Where'd it go? Wait, do you all see my presentation? Is it still being shared? Am I crazy? No. Mm -mm. That's the wrong thing. It's the wrong presentation. This one I poached my own slides earlier. But that's all the same stuff. All right, y'all see that, right? Yep. Okay, cool. So feel free to reach out to me, especially if you have questions about landscape design. We were supposed to have a landscape design workshop actually in April, um, but obviously that got postponed. And that's not something that we can reasonably do online. We have to do that in person. But if you have questions about designing, whether it be natives or non-natives, uh, the, the design principles are all exactly the same. So I can give you all those, I can get you some resources to help with designing. So um, designing with natives, it really comes down to right plant, right place, making sure that you're selecting the appropriate plants that grow well in your landscape. And sometimes a simple way to think about designing with natives is think about your environment that you're planting, you know, that right plant, right place kind of idea. What is the closest Florida ecosystem that is similar to your landscape and use that native planting palette as your landscaping palette? 
that's just a really easy just let the nature pick its plants for you <laughs> yes when you're watering in your landscape yeah absolutely you can scout for problems during that period it just it gives you an opportunity to be out in your landscape landscapes aren't hands-off they can be low maintenance but they're not hands-off <laughs> so that's a really good question so uh it's a i don't have an irrigation system as our property is not that set up for it so i water my plants one by one good thing i'm retired um, my question is when you look at a plant that droops during those long hot days I fight myself not to water them again so is there a logic to how to handle that other than what I have done which is right plant right place um, so usually what's happening is yes they're getting too much sun and that plant is almost like um, Mark feel free to jump in on this one that's like a plant stress response it's trying to preserve or prevent water loss and um, what will happen is obviously you've probably noticed when the sun moves away it whoosh, stretches back out uh, it fills back out so it, yeah heat wilt is what sometimes we'll call it um, but it's just a stress response typically we just what that means is it's yeah it's probably getting a little too much sun compared to what it wants um, a great example is I have um, I had some tractor plant for Fujium in a spot that would get a little bit too much sun and it would do that. And as soon as the sun move out of the way, it pop right back up again. Yeah, Mark putting some more information about, about um, soil surface and the, the surficial roots drying out. Best method to get rid of sand spurs. That, <laughs> that's a very true statement. Sand spurs are, are a landscape nuisance. Um, <clears throat> so I'm not sure what those recommendations are specifically for uh, sand spurs. Um, I will have to look that one up. I think I got caught up with all the questions. Thank you all so much. Um, thank you all for joining us. And tomorrow, actually, we have another program. It's the Vegetable Garden for Beginners. And that one's completely sold out. Uh, but uh, feel free, our YouTube channel will, again, we'll post the recording of this webinar and tomorrow's webinar if you're not registered onto our YouTube page so you can watch at a later time. But I want to thank you everybody for joining us this afternoon or this evening, I guess now. Um, and feel free to reach out to me or anybody within the extension office or the master gardener volunteers. If you have any questions, comments, or concerns that you have, uh, especially with regarding your landscape, we'll help you out. And on September 1st, we also have a composting talk that's coming up. Um, and that registration announcement will be coming out in a couple days. So thank you all. <laughs>